So good morning. Uh, welcome to Boko, Boko Slit Festival 2020. Uh, we, bring, we want to bring you this special event in commemoration uh, of International Day for Reparations. The actual International Day for Reparations is, is celebrated tomorrow, and that's October 12th. And October 12th has a significant meaning for peoples of the Americas. Uh, it was on that date in 1492 that Christopher Columbus set foot on the so-called New World. And in doing so, he ushered in a cycle of occupation, violence, genocide, and slavery that heralded the advent of colonization. And that colonial legacy continues to plague the people of our region. And we are at this pivotal juncture in our history, which I like to call the George Floyd moment then black people and people of color are actually saying enough is enough. It took the 21st century lynching of a 46 year old man uh, on May the 25th of this year by four Minneapolis police officers uh, displayed on television for all the world to see to finally spark that sense of indignation globally. And we watched Floyd beg for his life um, as one white police officer, Derek Chauvin, knelt callously on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And Floyd called out for his mother, repeatedly saying the phrase, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And that phrase has now become a familiar refrain, not only in the United States, but all over the globe. And in many respects, it represents the asphyxiation of opportunities that black people around the world have had to endure for over 400 years. We are delighted to have with us Sahiri Beckles. Sahiri Beckles, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies and the Chair of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. And he's a noted Caribbean historian and advocate for reparations for slavery. So welcome, Sahiri. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Andy. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this day and with all of the, 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 the Boca folks and everyone else. Uh, very good day. Wonderful. So, so, Hillary, in your book, I just went through your book one more time, The, the First Black Slave Society, uh, Britain's Barbarity Time in Barbados, 1636 to 1876. And it was published by University of West Indies Press back in 2016. I think I think you mentioned to me in a in a sort of text message once that sometimes these books come back in in vogue at particular moments in time, and you state that everyone must understand the legacy of slavery and the enduring power dynamics before real change can actually take place in our society, and perhaps you can help us our audience to see the link between the George Floyd moment and the history and legacy of slavery. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy. First of all, I I wrote that book uh, so as to uh, center the historic moment uh, in which uh, black life was matter mattering only in the context of an economic paradigm, mm -hmm. and it was Barbados that was the source of that concept when in 1636, the British enslavers on that island developed legislation that said that from here on in, any African person who arrives on this island will be classified as chattel, property, real estate, and non-human. Mm -hmm. That was the first significant framing of the notion of black people as property dispensable, uh, having no social presence. And from there, that legislation was taken to Jamaica, South Carolina, and it spread across the entire plantation America from the North and Alaska down to Argentina. Uh, 
that concept became the frame and it originated at a moment of extreme wealth accumulation and black people caught up in this notion that your only purpose uh, in this society is to assist uh, Englishmen and white people in general to make a lot of money and make it quickly. You have no other human presence. You have no existential significance to anyone other than in a market. That became the norm. Mm -hmm. And because it became the norm, the consequences that followed from that. For example, the, 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 the Floyd moment. What really was that moment? That was a pictorial, graphic imaging of how easy it is to dispense with black life. But the Barbados legislation, they went on to frame the 1661 slave code. And that slave code that became the template for Plantation America mm -hmm. gave the white community the opportunity to dispose of black life as a spectacle. And, and so when the first rebellion was planned in Barbados in 1675, the first of its kind, uh, those who were captured, they lit an enormous bonfire mm -hmm. and they burnt 21 people to death. The English burnt alive 21 people as a public display and then the others who were not burnt to life were gibbeted. That is, you were, they put you in a cage and the cage was hanging from a tree and there you died and the rats and the bats and the birds ate you. So the notion of displaying the destruction of black life is deeply embedded in our history and culture. And that Floyd moment was just one of those final moments where as a spectacle, as a show, as a triumphant display of power, black life was destroyed. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of our listeners and viewers would probably be surprised that this beautiful, beautiful Barbados, uh, as the Merry Men <laughs> used to sing, beautiful Barbados would be the, the place, the location for this experimentation of what they seem to think is white supremacy. Um, you know, the, the this creation of the, of the this notion of white supremacy, this division between the blacks and the whites uh, on the island of Barbados. Why is it that Barbados became that pivotal place for this experimentation with white supremacy? It's a very good question, Andy. When the English arrived, or when the Europeans arrived in the Caribbean in the post-Columbus moment, when they came in large numbers, they encountered resistance from the indigenous population in most places. In most places, they were trying to make their investments in sugar plantations and coffee plantations and gold mining, whatever, whatever was the extractive economic paradigm. They encountered significant resistance. But in Barbados, when they arrived in 1627, the English made a very interesting description of their arrival. They wrote to the king, and they said, we have found an empty island. Mm -hmm. There are no people on this island, but there are houses everywhere. Mm. Houses everywhere, but no people. Because the, the Spanish were raiding Barbados to take away the native people, to take them to Mexico to work in the mines. Mm. The Portuguese were raiding Barbados to, to capture the native people, to take them to Brazil to work on the sugar plantations. Mm -hmm. And those who survived this fled from Barbados to the neighboring islands, Dominica, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, largely because Barbados is a flat society, no mountains, no forest to resist, and the native people were the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And because of their vulnerability, genocide was carried out on Barbados. So Barbados became the first island to be emptied mm. by slave trading, slave raiding, and the genocide. The English therefore could start from scratch, no internal resistance. Mm. And they laid out their plantations, they brought in their Africans, and sugar was the big deal. It was the most lucrative commodity on the world market, agricultural commodity. And the frenzy 
to make a quick fortune in the context of the English Civil War, where these people who had lost their fortunes in England in the Civil War uh, come into the Caribbean to rebuild their fortunes or to create new fortunes, and slavery was brought in as the paradigm. This was the model, and they went straight in. No consideration. They abandoned all the traditional moral values, all the traditional labor systems, all the traditional methods of dealing with workers and laborers, obligations, paternalism. They abandoned all of that, and they went straight into the deepest end of capitalist market, Labor is here for one purpose, and Barbados started this project. And the Barbados enslavers became the richest people in plantation America. They made a fortune in the first 20, 30 years, and the Barbados model became known as a global model. And what was the Barbados model? Sugar, plantation, chattel, slavery, and that became the global model. And it spread throughout the Caribbean. As I said, South Carolina, Virginia, it went to the Americas, it went everywhere. And yes, it was seeded in Barbados and it flourished throughout the hemisphere. Well, no longer, I mean, I think it's, um, it's not, it's not uh, after reading your book, I realized that um, the British had a difficult time uh, accepting the abolition of slavery. For that very same reason right because they did so well on this island of barbados so in barbados there, there was lots of resistance against the abolition of slavery would you say that that um, that was the case uh it, from your historical reading well you see having built this model which was classified globally as uh one of the most successful experiments in wealth accumulation and that model became hemispheric, uh, it, became, it became global. It was a model that was uh, suited to the moment of imperial capitalism. And it was seen as one of the first frontiers. So when the conversation shifted towards uh, emancipation abolition, and I should say this, Andy, it's important, I think, to say this, there were always people around in the formative stages of this system who were saying this is wrong it is wrong it is sinful it is unchristian it's immoral yeah. and there were always groups of people who were saying that but it was so easy to push them aside by the investor class mm -hmm. the investor class said this is in the national interest so when the investor class classified this plantation chattel white supremacy model as in the national interest, all of those who were protesting on the, on, on the streets of London and Amsterdam and wherever there were, those people who were up in arms against this were brushed aside by the state who had agreed with the investor class that this might be emotionally disturbing for many of you citizens but this is in the national interest. So when the emancipation moment came and the state had now agreed that we don't need this no more, it has served its historic purpose. Britain is now a sustainable economic revolutionary nation. Uh, industrial development has now become uh, you know, globally competitive. It was now time to remove this immorality, this sin, and to twist the narrative to say, it is no longer in the national interest. And when they did that in the Caribbean, and especially in Barbados, the conversation was, we will not be party to the destruction of a culture that we had created. Chattel slavery and its white supremacy infrastructure is a product of our world. We created it out of our imagination and we implemented it. And you, the British government, that was our partner for 200 years, and now you want to slip away, but we are not going to undo that which we had done. And so the Barbados Parliament fought tooth and nail against the British government. Uh, in this context, and they said, no, this is our model, this is our culture, it's our social culture, it's our economic culture, and we will not undo it.
and they fought to the bitter end. In the end, the British government had to threaten them to undo that which they had done together. Well, that's interesting because once they finally decided to accept the abolition of slavery, uh, the British government actually paid reparations to the slave owners and not to the slaves. So how, how can we justify, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we're talking today about reparations, because how can we justify the fact that these British slave owners were given compensation uh, once they gave up their slaves, um, rather than giving compensation to the poor slaves who were work working for free? Well, you know, the, the British and all the other European Emancipation Acts were among the most racist legislation passed in their parliament. The British government had been dodging the matter for 200 years when the question was asked in their parliament. Is the status of black people as property, non-human, is that validated in British law? And the British state had been dodging that by saying, no, it's colonial law. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is in the colonies that this classification of black people and this white supremacy system. But the truth is that the, the European governments have framed that for its colonies and you could not separate national law from colonial law because the British Parliament validated the laws of the colonies. Right. And for the first time in the Emancipation Act, having agreed that they were going to pay reparations to the slave owners, they had to find a formula to allow the executive to instruct the judiciary to instruct the treasury to pay this money. And what was the formula? Classify the black people as property. And then we will use property compensation legislation and ethics to push the Emancipation Act through. So the government therefore had to admit finally that black people are property, non-human. And therefore, the Emancipation Act is a property compensation act where the slave owners were paid property compensation. Now, understand how that worked. The British government, for example, sent the actuaries and the accountants to do the calculation. They had over just over 600,000 enslaved Africans. They put a commercial value of 45 million pounds. This is the replacement value. All of the enslaved people in the Caribbean and the British Caribbean were worth 45 million pounds. The British government then said, okay, we are going to give the slave owners 20 million in cash, mm -hmm. upfront in cash. They could have cash, they can have bonds, and they borrowed that money from the Rothschilds Corporation. They borrowed this money under a bond from the Rothschilds Corporation, and they paid 20 million in cash to the enslavers. The question was then asked, well, how are they going to be compensated the remaining 25 million? What the Emancipation Act did was to say, after we have freed the blacks, we are going to ask them to work for six additional years for free to work off in kind the remaining 25 million. So that the legislation insisted that the freed Africans had to work for free for another specified period of years to pay in kind to the enslavers 25 million pounds in labor. So that in the end, the black people, the emancipation black people paid more in reparations to the enslavers than the British government because the enslavers received 25 million from the, the people they had enslaved and the British government paid them the balance. So the act was an absolute exploitative and, and pretty racist piece of legislation on those two fronts. A, that the black people are not human and property and they're gonna pay property compensation. And two, the blacks had to pay more for their emancipation by way of reparations to slave owners. The British government went on over the next hundred years to say, oh, well, you know, the British people in their kindness abolished slavery and gave the world a higher moral code 
But the truth is it was a racist and horrible piece of legislation that should be condemned by any right thinking person. And, and, and this, is, this is how white supremacy works. It spins the narrative. It covers over the history. It suppresses the truth. And it gives you an, an image of triumphalism by the white supremacy leader. Right. Well, listen, I think um, one of the things that, uh, that you said, I, in, in, I think back in July, in your capacity as chair of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, is that you would like to see a reparations summit that would involve the governments of the Caribbean and those of the European countries, along with representatives from private corporations and universities and civil society organizations to discuss the contribution that they can make to development a development plan for the Caribbean. Uh, I believe that that purpose, the purpose of your, your what you envision as a three day summit would be to ignite a serious discussion on how best to honor the historical debt owed to the Caribbean by former slave holdings, uh, former slave holding and colonizing European states. And I think you've made it quite clear that reparatory justice is about development and that Britain and Europe, European countries owe a debt to the Caribbean region, a debt that is, can be recognized, a debt that can be computed, a debt that is historically sound in terms of its leg legitimacy. So is this now the propitious moment to advance the case of reparations and to make it more widely understood? Well, yes, Andy, and um, allow me to provide uh, some historical context to that proposal, which is very much uh, at the center of CARICOM's thinking at the moment. Mm -hmm. We first of all must understand that the issue of colonization uh, came in three phases in respect of the citizens of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I call it the, the three acts of one play. Mm -hmm. First, the, 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 the genocide of our native indigenous peoples that continues today. Then the chattel enslavement of the African people. This is the second act in the play. Then the deceptive indentureship of the Asian people, mostly from India, uh, who are absolutely deceived and, and, and brought into a new neo-slavery form of exploitation. We had those three processes so, uh, you know, sequentially. Mm -hmm. Then there is the issue of colonization as an extremely violent process. And this colonization came into the present time. It is not an incomplete process. The Caribbean is still one of the few places in the world where there are European colonies. So colonization is not incomplete in the Caribbean. The Caribbean is still a colonized space. There are still French colonies, there are English colonies, there are Dutch colonies, and there's an American colony. So colonial status, that is the oppression of a people by an outsider force that manipulates their capacity to achieve uh, self-direction and, and sovereignty, that is still a Caribbean experience. So we are still in the throes of fighting against colonialism. So that when the United Nations declared in the 1960s they were going to set up these international bodies to push through decolonization, that was 60 years ago, the process is not complete. So we need to go back to the United Nations and say, you know, those committees on colonization that were part of the rethinking of the new world you need to come back to the table because the process is not complete. And we in the Caribbean are still involved in the colonial experience. The institutions of colonization are very much with us today. The reason why, Andy, you made reference to my book, Britain's Black Death, but if you look on the cover of that book, you will see a photograph. And that photograph was taken from the Barbados archives. It's a photograph taken in 1966 of Queen Elizabeth's visit to Barbados. And on her visit to Barbados, she was hosted, um, feted 
at the plantation of her cousin, the Duke of Harewood. The Duke of Harewood was entertaining his cousin, the Queen, in the year of Barbados' independence. And here in the middle of the independence moment, the national, the Queen, her cousin, the Duke of Harewood, on the plantation, that plantation was bought by the Dukes of Harewood in 1782 with some 200 enslaved Africans on it. Fast forward from 1782 to 1966, the year in which I entered high school and the Duke of Harewood is still owning a sugar plantation and his cousin, the queen is there. And why is the queen there as his cousin? Because in 1922, the royal family and the Dukes of Hayward intermarried. That was seen then that the royal family that had started the organization of the slave trade, the Royal African Company of, 17, of 1672, the stock was owned by the royal family and the majority of the aristocrats. King James later became King James, Duke of York at the time, was the chairman of the board of directors. This was a royal enterprise that began large slave trading to the Caribbean. So the, the, the skions of slave trading, the royal family, the largest slave owning family in the Caribbean, the Dukes of Hayward, intermarried, creating a dynasty of royalty and aristocracy presiding over slavery and the legacies of it. And the photograph captures that history in one flash, that history of capture. And so what we are speaking about is contemporary history those who have said, oh, well, you know, slavery, plantation, indentureship, all of that was a long time ago, we have moved on. No, it is here, alive and well. Now, the reason why we have said in the CARICOM Reparations Commission that this is all about development, mm -hmm. because the effort to discredit the reparatory justice movement, which says, well, you know, and the reparations is about looking back with anger and looking back with vexation, uh, black people, rather than taking responsibility for the economic development and the transformation, they are looking for a handout from white people, from people who have nothing to do with the contemporary poverty and marginalization. So those are the counter arguments. What we have said is, listen, let us look at this 20th century. In the 1930s and 40s, the majority of the people in the Caribbean rose up against colonization and demanded independence and freedom. Reluctantly, because of their strong support, they were granted. At the moment where they were asking for sovereignty, independence, and the negotiations took place, they asked for a development grant to fund the first national development plans for these countries. Jamaica was first out of the blocks, moving to independence 1962. The premier of Jamaica, Sir Alexander Bustamante, accompanied by the Honorable Edward Siaga. In the first week of July, 1962, months before independence, they went to England to discuss a development plan. And they said to the British government, the Macmillan government, and Reginald Morden was Secretary of State for Colonies, Jamaica is now entering independence. You have colonized our island for 307 years. The island is in a mess in terms of infrastructure potential for development. This is the first national 10-year strategic plan and we're asking for a contribution. I think the figure was a mere 20 million pounds. Mm 
to build factories, to build roads, to create the foundations for economic development. The British government told the Premier of Jamaica, literally, to go to hell. Edward Siaga, to his credit, became so irate by what the British government had told Jamaica. He said, listen, Jamaica is in a shambles because you have extracted all of the wealth of Jamaica over 300 years. He said, we have, we have spaces in schools for 7% of the children. 7% of the space in schools for children. Jamaica today is still struggling with providing good capacity for all of the children as a civil right. Or, he said, we have, we have housing for only 20% of the people, appropriate housing. Only 15% of the households have running water. And he outlined the result of British extraction of wealth, leaving Jamaica in a condition that they did need that capital injection to move towards sustainable economic development. They thought they had a right to it. The Jamaica Premier said, we have a right, you must treat us equitably. They would dismiss. Eric Williams was next. He went up to London to discuss support for his five-year economic development plan, which was a magnificent national plan to convert a colony into a sustainable industrial nation. And Britain told him the same thing. It was Williams who I think coined the expression most precisely. After he left the House of Parliament where he met with the British government, he went to give a lecture to students at LSE. And he, he started his lecture with the following statement. For us in the Caribbean, Britain sees us as an orange. And the students looked kind of dismayed by this concept of being seen as orange. He said, he went on to say, they have sucked us dry, thrown the peel onto the ground, and now their only concern is that they're not going to step on the peel. And that was how Williams captured Britain's rejection Meanwhile, Britain had given 50 million pounds development aid to Malta to go off into their independence. Meanwhile, Britain had met with the leaders of the East Indian colonies. So bear in mind, Britain has two groups of colonies, the East Indies colonies, the West Indies colonies. Met with the leaders of the East Indies colonies in Ceylon and worked out what became known as the Colombo Plan. The Colombo Plan was a kind of martial aid plan for the East Indian colonies. So Sri Lanka, India, Burma, Malaysia, and so on. And they received this framework. The East Indian colonies received this framework for development in which Britain pumped millions of pounds to facilitate the transition of the East Indies colonies into nations, mm -hmm. into sovereign nations along the industrial trajectory. And off the East Indies went into development. The result is history. We can see what it is now. The West Indies were told to go to hell. And why did they reject the West Indies? Because the West Indies was the place where they had put the white supremacy system in place. The West Indies was the home of their white supremacy culture. Black people were not only, in their thinking, not entitled to a development plan, not entitled to a development plan. They were not deserving of it. They were not deserving of a development plan because they are the offspring of enslaved Africans who were property. They are not deserving. And they pushed the West Indies aside, leaving the West Indies in a shamble. Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, had said in, in 1926, uh, a few years after he was no longer Prime Minister, he said, the Caribbean is the slum of the British Empire. Mm. It, is, it, has, it has the worst demographic public health indices in the British Empire. We were the slum. And this is why, because we were the slum, we were treated as slum dwellers,
for the next 50 years. So we got no support. And we went for a federation because we thought the best way to lay the foundation for economic growth and social integration was to federate. Britain refused to give them any support of any serious significance. They're underfunded. And now, Andy, we have the archives of that period. Mm -hmm. We have the documents of that period now made publicly available. And we can now establish that the British strategy was to deliberately financially suffocate the Federation because they knew that it was a strategy for West Indian development. And any development paradigm that came out of the Caribbean, they were going to block it. But thankfully now, we have those intergovernment documents where the foreign office was speaking to the cabinet office and we have those correspondence where the British government made it perfectly clear. They are going to give it formal support, but the real strategy is they're going to strangulate it. They're going to strangulate it and they're going to set those islands against each other as they have always done. But now we have the proof of that. And all of this is captured in a book I have just completed entitled How Britain Underdeveloped the Caribbean, a repertory justice response. So reparations then, we have put all of this together and we have said in our commission, it is about development. It's about economic and social development. Britain has a debt. And we are building upon the Arthur Lewis paradigm because in 1940, so Arthur Lewis, you know, our Nobel laureate in economics, he said, the only chance these Caribbean islands have of moving into development, industrialization, global competitiveness, is they need, they must have a major injection of capital to lay the infrastructure. Right. The most obvious source of that capital injection, he said, is the value of the 200 years of free labor. He said, Britain took 200 years of free labor, and we did the numbers, 200 years of free labor from about 15 million people. If you take 200 years of free labor from 15 million people, including adults and children, and remember, you know, the children entered the production system as soon as they were weaned, three and four years old, they were out on the plantations uh, carrying out tasks because the notion of an unemployed, an unemployed asset, you could not tolerate the notion of an unemployed asset. All assets had to go to work. And we did a calculation and you're talking about seven trillion pounds if you were to make a calculation on the unpaid labor Britain took from the Caribbean. That is more than their GDP. But it's just a reference to give you a sense of the enormity of it. And so we have said, Britain must come back to the table for stage two. What is stage two? Stage one is when they sat at Lancaster House and discussed the terms and conditions of independence. Bear in mind, Andy, in those conversations, the CARICOM governments back then had actually said, you need to give us a grant of about 200 million pounds to begin this journey. So there was always a development figure on the table and Britain had consistently rejected any development aid for the Caribbean. Their position was, we will give you social aid. Mm. We are not giving you development capital we're giving you social aid. So to the extent that we admit responsibility for the poverty and the degradation in the Caribbean, we will give you social aid. We will give you something towards health, something towards um, public health care, diseases control and so on. But support for economic development, out of the question. We have said we want to go back to the table and we've invited the governments of Europe to come back to the table to discuss the legacy of colonization, the poverty, the endemic challenges, not only with public health, inadequate infrastructures for schools, uh, terrible situations in terms of human rights for hospital and public health care, very poor undeveloped agricultural systems. And we have said, you need to come back to this.
there are seven museums dealing with slavery and colonization in Britain, where school children and teachers can take the children to explore. There isn't one in the Caribbean other than the one built by the French in Guadeloupe. The English have not put a cent towards even an institution of learning where these children and the teachers can go. So civic society institutions. You know, Andy, I attended half of my high school years in Barbados and the other half in the UK because I was a part of the Windrush. Mm -hmm. You know, my parents looking for work, looking for jobs to feed their families, packed up and went to England to work in the factories. And as children, we were caught up in the second, the second slave trade, you know. They brought us from Africa to the Caribbean and now they're taking us from the Caribbean back to England. But it, it was the circle of black labor. I grew up there. And when I went to high school in the UK, every summer, the teachers, the teachers across England would take the children to Europe on, on culture tours to let them see the roots of their culture. And we were taken to Athens to see the Acropolis and the Pantheon. We were taken to Rome to see the Colosseum and all of those magnificent Asian European structures. So my classmates were able to touch base with the roots of their civilization. And even though they were working class children, mostly working class white children, they were inducted into the journey of the history of their culture and civilization, and it made them feel very proud, it made them feel supremacist, and the vast majority of working class people grew up with this sense of tradition of civilization, which was part of sustaining the white supremacy value system, even among the working class. I am an African, totally disconnected like all of us from our roots. We know nothing about where we have come from in a serious fundamental way. The average citizen has no idea. The children in the schools have no idea. But the point I'm making is that the white supremacy system disconnects all of the children of African descent from ancestry, leaving you culturally adrift from a sense of location. And when you experience that on both sides, and I experienced it because I went to see the Acropolis and I went to see uh, you know, the Colosseum. I saw that, but the other part of me had no idea whatsoever. But I, I knew as a child that the plantation on which I grew up, on which my family worked as laborers, which was owned in fact by the, the Cumberbatches. And you might very well ask me who are the Cumberbatches. Well, you know Benedict Cumberbatch. Mm -hmm. Benedict Cumberbatch is one of my favorite actors. Uh, he's, I think he's arguably British, Britain's finest actor. But they own slave plantations in the Caribbean, in Barbados, into my lifetime. And my, my grandparents, the, 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 the maternal name in my family is Cumberbatch. You know, um, because they worked on the Cumberbatch estate. So you can say that the Cumberbatch estates produce an historian or an academic, it also produce an actor. So it produced an actor and an academic, the same plantations. But do I know if I have any relation to him? I have the Cumberbatch name. I, my grand, my great grandmother who raised me in Post of Interest, her name was Adriana Cumberbatch and she worked for the Cumberbatches. So, you know, we have this, disruption of identity and history. We need to connect all of that. So the reparations that we are talking about is about laying the foundation for investment in the economic development of the Caribbean. At the same time, it is for building institutions to allow for issues of identity and sovereignty and rights and education to be rooted and the pedagogy of identity and education and culture. So this is not a handout process, Andy. This is about negotiating the economic and social transformation of the Caribbean that had been extracted to the max in terms of its wealth 
and the call for a return, a repatriation of at least a part of that wealth to support economic transformation and social development. Wonderful. I, you know, I, I, I thought we should probably intersperse into my questioning some questions coming from the audience because we started to get some questions now coming from the audience. And I think you just answered actually one of the questions from Adrian Lord. And I, I recognize that name because I think we went to school together. <laughs> yes. Adrian Lord from Barbados. Uh, but he's <laughs> question in about um, how in practical terms are we going to uh, address this issue of reparations? Because uh, to whom should the, the money be paid? And when should it be paid and so on? I mean, I think in some ways you've captured in essence what you just said just now, uh, the fact that we're not necessarily looking at sort of paying money to individual people, but rather to the community at large and, and, and in, the, in the sort of concept of developing the countries that were less un poorly underdeveloped by the British. And one could say also the French and the and the Dutch and all the other. Yes, of course. Well, we can't we can't ignore that. Uh, but there's another question here from Das Driver. He said that there was one British plantation slave colony outside of the Caribbean, and this one was in Cape Colony, now part of the Republic of South Africa. Yes. He wants to know: Have the Caricom governments sought to enroll South African government? in advocating for reparations as well. Okay, well, let's just, let us take Dr. Laura's uh, perspective. Having created an economic and social development paradigm, and I started the presentation by making reference to the UN institutions, the Committee on Decolonization that were established in the 1960s to guide decolonization and to push forward what was called uh, Ethical, ethical decolonization. The concept of ethical decolonization is that you do not walk away from the source of your extraction of wealth and the poverty you have left behind. You do not walk away from it. You have a commitment to facilitate its infrastructural development. Uh, the European powers abandoned that and walked away. No ethical connection to the site of the wealth extraction. They walked away. What we are looking at now, and we are considering this very seriously, that there should be the launch under the auspices of the United Nations, one of its agencies, uh, an IDF. An IDF is an investment development fund established under the auspices of uh, the relevant United Nations agency, it could be UNDP, it could be any of those agencies, in which all of the countries, companies, persons, and institutions that have given all of these apologies in recent years for the extraction of wealth from slavery and colonization, they could put this money into this fund. It would be a good thing to begin with maybe about $50 billion so that in the last couple of months, we have received apologies from the Bank of England because the Bank of England was established to regulate all of the cash coming into England from slavery. There was so much cash and so many small provincial banks. The government put the Bank of England together to regulate all of that cash coming in, standardize it and make it available to, in, to industrialists in England who could borrow that money now from the provincial banks and invest it to build factories for industrial development. So Caribbean cash could circulate in the British economy under a guided model. So the Bank of England has sent the apology. Lloyds of London, the largest insurance company in the world that made its fortune from insuring not only the slave ships, but insuring the, the Africans as property, they have issued their apology. Every bank on the high streets of England, all the banks that you know, yeah. Lloyds, Barclays, National Westminster, Midlands, all of them began their journey in the financing of slavery and colonization. And they've all issued. But now we have said, okay, apology is never enough when the damage is here. We are thinking that this is the way forward. An IDF, an investment development fund, globally and nationally managed for the purpose of sponsoring economic and social development at the site of the extraction. 
This was the model that was used largely by the Jewish reparations committees that got their reparations out of Europe. It's a model that was used also in the Colombo plan where Britain and the, and the other powers agreed to give the East Indians a framework for development, investing in universities, investing in hospitals, airports, seaports, roads and bridges, agricultural modernization. That was the Colombo plan. We want the Colombo plan in the West Indies as well. So that is how it would work. It is not about handing out checks on street corners. However, in the context of the USA, where there is a, a fracture in terms of methodology, because some of those families in the USA have said, no, we were plundered of our wealth deep into the 20th century. The Tulsa, the Tulsa burning was all about black businesses being destroyed two decades into the 20th century. How do you compensate people today for losses of their grandparents and great grandparents? So I will not rule out, certainly in the US case, the notion of families and individuals who were plundered by the state, both federal and local, and all of the institutions of the state, that you can also approach it in that way. But in the Caribbean context, we, are, we, we recognize the diversity of models for reparations. But in the Caribbean, the model that we are looking about is about economic development, social transformation, investment for the public good, investment for the betterment of all of the people in the society, investment in bringing the Caribbean up to a development level of competitiveness. So bear in mind what we're saying. I want to make this point very clear, Andy. We are not advocating in any way that we are not taking responsibilities for ourselves because we have had to take responsibility for ourselves. We, we transform these colonies, these broken, these broken colonies, we transform them into functional democracies that was without the support of the colonizer. We took responsibility and we built democracies. I mean, I was absolutely amazed just a few weeks in Jamaica to watch the election taking place here. The country goes into election. The people in a pandemic, they went out and vote. There was a campaign, a very good campaign between two parties. The people voted. And within three hours, the, the victor was declared. And the prime minister was able to come and say, thank you for supporting us. We've won this election. And it all happened so beautifully and magnificently in a pandemic. That is part of our legacy of taking care of ourselves. But we also have to say that those who created the mess that we have been cleaning up, we have been cleaning up their mess in health and education and transport, logistics. We have been cleaning up their health. And how have we done it? by debt. We have been borrowing money to support our development from day one, and now we have this debt crisis because we were abandoned by those who took away our wealth, those who plundered our wealth, took it away from us. We now had to go and borrow money from them to fund our own development. This is the cycle in which you are trapped into poverty. Reparations is one of those techniques one of those instruments that will help to break that cycle where the extractor comes back to the region and partner with us, sit at the table with us to talk about how they are going to discharge their obligation to displace. It is not that we are abandoning responsibility for ourselves because we will never do that. We will never do that. So those are the kinds of concepts that we are looking at, uh, Andy. Thank you. And so that would include as well forgiveness of debt. Uh, well, one of, we have a 10 point plan that frames what the reparations ask is all about. And one of those items is indeed the cancellation of Caribbean debt to the multilateral institutions and to the, the, those that are operating within the Western economy. And we have said it has to be canceled because the Caribbean was the first site of Western wealth extraction.
when the West was struggling to come together to see what its potential was, they located the Caribbean as the place where they could all come and extract wealth out of slavery and colonization to fund their development. So now they have gone off into this sustainable development trajectory thanks to slavery, indentureship, colonization, leaving us behind in this mess. So they are now well advanced. So we now have to borrow money from them to build schools, to build hospitals, to pay for education, to sustain basic infrastructural needs, to maintain libraries in the, in the communities. We have to borrow money from those who extracted the money from us to meet our basic needs. That is an immorality. Mm. And basically the issue, Andy, is this. In a, in a simple sentence, if we are going to prepare for a 21st century world that is fair and just. If we are going to prepare, we have to repair. The only way the globe, the Western world especially, is going to prepare for a harmonious 21st century is if they repair the crimes of the past. Because those crimes of the past are imposing a heavy burden upon the present. The present, we are carrying this burden on our shoulder, including that psychological burden that says that a police officer can put his knee on the throat of a black man before the world to see and pose as if he's taking a picture, to pose in his triumphalism, like a fisherman who has caught the big one and he has it hanging there to show the world, look what I have done. That was the, the Floyd moment. Knee on the throat. Look what I have caught today. Another black man. Mm -hmm. All of that is part of the legacy that we live in today. All of that. And this is why the repertory justice movement, Andy, is going to be the greatest political movement of the 21st century. It's going to, it's going to embrace all of the people of the world who have been colonized, all of the people of the world who have been victims of white global supremacy, people from Africa, Asia, Oceania, including those in South Africa and the islands there, uh, uh, thereof. The whole world is going to say, we are not going into this 21st century with this system of civilization. We are not accepting it, we are rejecting it, and furthermore, we want justice. So. We're going to have this reparatory justice movement spreading out into the world, and it's going to be the biggest political movement. And why? Because we, the majority on this planet, are not prepared to live in this 21st century the way we have lived in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th. We are not going forward in that world. And to prepare for this 21st century world of justice, freedom, brotherhood, sisterhood, the, the celebration of humanity at its best, to, to live in a world of, of ethical relations and seeing the potential of all peoples contributing to the development of the world. To prepare for that, we have to repair, we have to repair the harm that was done in prior centuries. So reparations yeah. and preparation for this 21st century are hand and glove, sequentially A plus B. Mm -hmm. That I don't want to forget the point that was raised by by Das driver about South Africa. <clears throat> yes. Well, you know, Andy, there were yes, the bulk the bulk of the enslaved Africans uh, were in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. but there were pockets of enslaved Africans in the British Empire. Yes, and uh, Madagascar. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the islands off the coast, we have heard. But also, there were those who were working in the British Army. Mm -hmm. There were hundreds of enslaved Africans who were working in the British Army and in the British Navy. They were working for the government. They were government, government slaves. There were those who were working in the forts of Africa. And those forts off the coast of West Africa where the British protected the empire against the other Europeans, there were government, government slaves working 
in those battlements. So yes, the sugar plantations of the Caribbean uh, were the heartland, but Africans were globally enslaved by the British government and the governments of Europe and in the outposts and in the small societies, yes. So he is absolutely correct. Uh, that island was a part of the empire. And there were many enslaved Africans in small places, even in the East Indies. In Asia, there were enslaved Africans in Asia working for the British government. So yes, the British government itself was a major and significant enslaver. So it was a global system. It was not concentrated simply in the Caribbean. It was a global system. Very good. Now, <clears throat> one of our other um, audience members, Siobhan, um, Rodney Brig Brigdegill, in the Facebook post, he's, he asked about chapter nine of your book, where you mentioned slavery had ties with Buckingham Palace. And he says, is the, is the physical wealth of the British crown also tied to slavery? I think in some ways you mentioned some of that in a previous comment. But he wants to know whether or not the Queen has made any attempt to apologize for slavery. And if she has done that, what would be her next step? Let us go back to the issue of whether you are entitled to an apology or whether you are deserving of one. I think there are two concepts. The Queen of England found herself uh, in uh, New Zealand. She found herself in Australasia uh, offering an apology to the, the Maori people for the genocide and the land grab that was part of their experience. And yes, she did offer that apology. When the Indian peasants rose up against the British Empire at Amritsar, and the British government massacred those people to keep possession of their land. There was the apology to the peasants and reparations were paid to those people who were massacred. And the queen was a critical part of that process. The queen has made several visits to the Caribbean. And as children, many of us would line the streets and wave at her a queen. As she went by, we would wave at her queen because she was our queen. Never has there been an apology. It is always the question of whether you are deserving as to whether you have a right to it or whether you're deserving of it. The royal family is deeply steep historically in the slave trade. As I have said, they started the slave trade. They organized it, they incorporated it the three large corporations in Britain, first the Guinea Company of 1618, the Guinea Company, and then the second company in its modified form, the, the, the Company of Royal Adventurers Trading into Africa, going out to Africa to bring slaves, Africans into the Caribbean. When that company made so much money, it had to be incorporated and capitalized at a higher level. The Royal African Company, capitalized to bring five to 6,000 enslaved Africans per year, all these ships. And the, our island of Barbados, mm -hmm. the first shipment of Africans directly from Africa to Barbados was 1641, owned by the Royal African Company, Royal Adventurers, the Guinea, the Guinea Company. And mm -hmm. they owned a ship called the Star. That star arrived in Bridgetown. It left Africa with 299 Africans from the Gold Coast. It arrived in Barbados with 239 alive. And they went, they were all sold. The record said they were sold within three hours. The plantations couldn't get enough. Again, that was a company connected to the royal family. So you go all the way through the history and we see the connections. And remember, you know, the greatest, the greatest opponent of the abolition of the slave trade was King William. Mm -hmm. He actually said that the slave trade is necessary for Britain to maintain its global dominance in the world. And I am opposed to anyone 
who was opposed to it. He told William Wilberforce, be careful. Be careful you are in this parliament speaking about ending the slave trade. Be careful, you know, because this business is British business, good for Britain. So we have this very, very long history. Queen Victoria, you know, she comes to the throne as a young queen, just in the decade of emancipation. And what does she do? She endorses all of the efforts to neutralize the effect of emancipation. This is what led to the Jamaica massacre at Morant Bay in 1865, when the governor of Jamaica was given the authority to massacre poor people in a famine, famine in Jamaica, to massacre them for squatting on government on crown lands, squatting on lands owned by the queen to grow food. This is the history of the royal family. And they tried to justify the decision to do so because they said, if we allow black people to get land, how will the plantations get labor if the black people become peasants? If they become peasants and small farmers, how are the English plantations to get labor? So since the black farmer and the black peasant was the antithesis of the white supremacy plantation system, those who went and squatted on land had to be exterminated and they shot them down, they put ropes around their necks. And this is something we have to understand because while in the middle of the 19th century, Britain is leading the triumphant discourse of democracy. British Westminster democracy is evidence of the best governance model in the world. While they were celebrating that in England, what were they doing at the same time in their colonies in the Caribbean? They took William Gordon, one of Jamaica's leading civil rights advocate, and put a rope around his neck for saying that the peasants have a right to live. The peasant leaders, Bogo, they massacred and murdered hundreds of people across the Caribbean who were calling for democracy. Mm -hmm. And what the Caribbean experienced was not democracy, they experienced fascism. So yes, I remember as a student in the classroom asking the professors, is this schizophrenia of the British government? It's calling for democracy at home, but it's showing fascism to the people in the colonies. And the royal family presided over all of this. The throne speeches. So while Victoria was becoming the Empress of India, administering the extraction of wealth from India, instructions were being given to, to assassinate the leaders of the democracy movement in the Caribbean, all the way through the Caribbean. So we have to put all of that into the context so that we can understand exactly the historical background of power and governance. So that when Barbados says the time has come for us to become a republic, to end this, to end this legacy of, of monarchy, it is coming after a very long history where the monarchy had been a part of the governance architecture for slavery and colonization. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we have to, to understand. Wonderful. Now, listen, I, I'm going to try to, to collapse a couple questions because we're getting closer to the end now. But to collapse a couple questions. One was from uh, Rudbun uh, Lamumba, who says, we have amassed more than enough data to justify our demand for reparations globally. And during this international decade, is this a perfect time for us to ring that bell? Our collective psychology repair becomes very, very important at this time. And, uh, and he wants to know what, what your thoughts were. And the second question, and the second question has to do with what are Caribbean governments doing, uh, Caribbean country leaders or fellow leaders in the Caribbean? Are they doing enough? Uh, and this comes from another audience member. 
he wants to know, I think it's Raul, Raul Williams on Facebook. He says, do you think Caribbean governments have been sufficiently vocal in support of the movement for reparations? And what can they do more to ensure that rep reparatory justice uh, becomes, a, becomes a norm? Okay, I will begin at the end. In the last five years or so, the Caribbean governments have done more than any other part of the world within the government sector where this matter is being discussed. The Caribbean governments established the Reparations Commission to lay the foundation for the research for the advocacy. The Caribbean governments went out there on a limb and told the world, this is where we stand. So the Caribbean governments are in a very noble position for putting down, these are small countries, again, some of them still in this colonial space. And they went out there and they laid a foundation and they said, let this conversation begin and the governments launched that campaign. We have been working within the framework of government support. So our prime ministers, uh, people like, you know, Ralph Gonzalez, Mayor Motley, uh, going beyond that, people like Prime Minister Brown of Antigua and Barbuda, the prime ministers and the prime ministers and the presidents of Haiti, especially, CARICOM has done a magnificent job in taking this to the UN, taking it to the international forum. Now, where we are waiting for support is Africa. It's the African governments with their tremendous global influence. And sometimes we don't quite want to give Africa a sense of its global weight, but there, there is a tremendous of international political advocacy weight within the African Union. We are waiting for the African Union. We have had bilateral conversations with some of them. We have taken our message to them. They have reached out to us, the conversation is going on. But I believe that when the African states step up into this conversation, it is going to be the game changer. I also believe that what the question is saying is correct. We have researchers around the world. We have researchers working with us in universities and financial institutions in the cities of Europe and elsewhere who have said, the argument has been won. Mm -hmm. The world is now persuaded. The argument has been won. The fact that these multinational corporations that have been at the vanguard of this are issuing the apologies and, and so on, and have making, uh, making commitments. I agree, the argument for repertory adjustment has been won. A friend of mine has put it this way. He said, he said, you know, Hillary, you, the case is made. What you have at the moment is a situation where the jury has deliberated. The jury has deliberated and the jury has come to consensus and they have handed their verdict to the judge. It is now for the judge to act. And this is true. Now, the question is, who is the judge? The judge, no doubt, are the countries, the governments and the institutions that have been a part of this white supremacy system and that are denying the people, the victims of their, of their economic development, the victims of that denying them justice. So you're right, the argument has been won, the jury has deliberated, they have come to consensus, and they have handed a piece of paper to the marshal, and the marshal has handed that paper to the judge. We are now waiting to see what is going to happen. That is where we are at, and you're quite correct. But what we do need is for the African governments to step up into this conversation. The question is, why have they not done so? Many of them seem to have fallen victim to the notion that because the slave trade extracted Africans and globalized them as property, that their, their antecedent governments were partners. The European, the European apologists for slave trading, and this is university professors, governments, and all the rest of them, have spun this notion that the African states were partners to the European slave traders, and therefore they are on the moral defensive. That is an absolute mythology, and it is not true. The first thing we have to know is that you cannot have an international crime without a local partner. It's impossible. But the presence of the local partner does not make the nation and the people 
of that society a partner. It does not. We all know that there are very clear similarities between the slave trade and the narcotics trade. Many of these narcotic companies have more resources than small countries. The slave trade companies, like the Dutch West Indian Company, the British West Indian Company, the Royal African Company, those companies had more resources than any African government they encountered on the coast of West Africa in the 17th and 18th century. They had cannons. They had military garrisons. They had thousands of professional soldiers trained and ready to destroy any government. And importantly, we have the records of those companies in which from time to time we hear that the king of this nation is standing in the way of the, of the trade. The garrison is given permission to assassinate the king of that small nation because he is standing in the way of a slave trade. We have those records. We have the records that show how the African people were rising up against the slave trade, fighting against it, even when from time to time, one of their kings would say, well, I'll make a deal with the slave trading company. Do not take my people, but I would allow you passage through my country to the coast. Do not take my people, but I will go to war next door. In order to, in order to protect my nation, I will sabotage the neighboring nation, divide and rule. But importantly, the other comparison between the narcotics trade and the slave trade was the fact that guns became a critical part. What the European slave trading companies did was to militarize West Africa by dumping guns, guns for slaves, guns for slaves, dumping guns. The largest export of Western Europe to West Africa in the age of the slave trade were guns. And when we see what happens in many societies, the relations between narcotic and guns, the identical relation took place in West Africa. West Africa slave trade was the model of that, where you militarize, you arm, and you create a culture of destruction. Governments are disappearing. People are fleeing from their towns and their villages into the desert, into the forest. One of the reasons why we had a lot of problems with famine, because if you ask yourself, where do people normally live? People live in river valleys, fertile agricultural land along river valleys. But where are you most vulnerable if you are living in a West African village? You are in your most vulnerable place if you live in a valley, because the boats come up, the army come up, the guns and the cannons come up, and they're able to destroy communities, take vict victims, put them on the slave ship. So what do you do? You abandon your traditional villages. You abandon your traditional agricultural lands. You go to the forest, you go to the desert. Then you create an agricultural food security crisis because you have abandoned the lands that have sustained you for thousands of years. All of that was going on. The West Africans were the victims of this. And there were many cases with where a king might try to make a deal and the people get rid of him. They depose him because they are against all of this. So the argument somehow that West African leaders were part of this, it is a mythology and we need our African scholars to make the argument very clear. We have the data that the West African governments must reject that notion and they must come forward and state very clearly that they are supportive of the reparations movement at this time. When that happens at the African Union, it will find its way into the General Assembly of the UN. And that is where we want the African governments to come and make their, make their claim. It's yeah. going to be very important that they do that. And we're urging them, please, to step forward because the Caribbean is carrying this. The African-American community in the US pushing for this. So we have an axis between the Caribbean and the African-American community, which is really one community in different locations, one family. This is the epicenter. We need that epicenter also to spread to West Africa.
And then that is going to be the game changer. So this looks like a pan-Africanist kind of approach to the to the solving the problem. But I want to I want to squeeze in another couple of questions because I got about ten minutes left, less than ten minutes left now. Um, Melissa uh, Dukti uh, on YouTube has asked, "How do you see reparations assisting in building greater knowledge based economies in the Caribbean, uh, fostering new economic models, particularly after the ravages of COVID nineteen pandemic?" Good question. And you know, Andy, again, we we have to, we have to historicize. Yeah. This white supremacy system that all of us have been victimized by might have started within the investor class, but it was sustained by the university sector. The universities of the Western world are absolutely at the center of the creation of the ideology of white supremacy and how best to sustain it. The universities are at the heart of this. To the extent that there is an architecture of white supremacy, that structure was designed by the universities. The notion that you could convert people into property, real estate, legislate that and show how that function in jurisprudence, that came out of the universities. The notion that you can trans port millions of people across an ocean, bring them onto a business enterprise, uh, keep accounts, uh, generate value added. A lot of that came out of the economic faculties of universities. The notion that black people somehow have this genetic inferiority and all of this cognitive inferiority, a lot of that came out of the research universities of the Western world. And every area where we can see the elements of white supremacy. The universities were the infrastructure of this. They promoted it. The notion that you can structure people along hierarchies of color and this vertical system of white, brown, black, and shades within that. A lot of that sociology came out of the universities, the anthropology schools of the Western universities. So the university system now. So one of the issues within the CARICOM reparations plan is the calling for a new pedagogy of economic development, inclusive economic development, mm -hmm. a rejection of the notion that people's skin color has anything to do with their cognitive capacity. The universities have a role to play now in undoing all of that it had done. All of those things it had done, it must now undo. And one by one, the universities are coming on board. But effectively, when we look at the situation in the Caribbean with the, with the COVID-19, what COVID-19 has done is to remove the roof of the Caribbean household. So let's have a look inside. It has exposed the poverty, the inequality, the gender violence against women and children, all of those horrendous legacies COVID has now exposed. Now, for example, we are asking, we are asking for a multidisciplinary approach. Before COVID arrived in the Caribbean, our university had established a task force of the best virologists, microbiologists, uh, epidemiologists to look at this virus and how it will impact the Caribbean. So we were ready for it in terms of the science. What was interesting, when it actually came, that task force had to be restructured away from what we call the pure and applied sciences, we had to restructure to include gender studies, feminist research, anthropology, sociology, political science, because then we saw that the catastrophe transcended the issues of science. It was now about the injustices against the majority. Every day in the Caribbean, we are hearing news and more research. We have shifted our primary schools to online learning. 40% of the children, 40% of the children in the primary schools don't have access to online learning because the communities are so poor, they don't have any internet. And where they have internet, they have no tablets. So now we have just a third of our children unable to access their education because COVID has shifted to online and a third of our citizens' 
are now removed from that world. So we have, we have an, an existential threat taking place. So yes, these are the things that reparations should be addressing. We now have to revise our 10 point plan to say, in addition to reparations for schools, education, we now have to put the digital footprint. We now have to say that the, the billion dollars that we are going to need to put all of these islands, town and country into the context of digital access. The governments don't have the money to do this right now. They don't have the money to do this right now because the main industry tourism has been shot through. The governments are facing a serious cash flow problem and the children are not able to get to school. Every child should be in school. Every child. It's a, it's a civil right. And you cannot say to children that we don't have the internet to put you in school when all the other kids from the middle classes are in school and these kids from the working classes are not in school. These are the issues that the Repertory Justice Project should be dealing with and these are the things we want to discuss about COVID, post-COVID, because we, put the, we call it the triple C in the Caribbean. The triple C destroying the Caribbean world at the moment. Chronic diseases. The black people in the Caribbean, if you use chronic disease as a marker, hypertension, type two diabetes, obesity, if you use that, then the black people in the Caribbean are the sickest people in the world when it comes to chronic diseases per capita. Then we have climate change, destroying our beaches and a culture of tourism. Many of us, the beaches that we knew as children don't exist no more. Rising sea levels, we have documented that, climate change. And on top of the chronic diseases and the climate change have come COVID. And they are interactive, mm -hmm. creating a cocktail of existential threat to these islands. These are the issues that are now in the forefront of a reparatory justice strategy. Because without multilateral support, without international support, for these crises that have nothing to do with the people of the Caribbean, externally imposed upon the Caribbean. The Caribbean is not going to make it. Mm -hmm. Not going to make it. Let me squeeze in a question here from Ryan Bashu um, via YouTube. He says, given the state of the Brexit ne negotiations right now and the UK economy on a downward spiral, how much do you, do you find the this become challenging for reparations to become a reality? Every moment, Andy, in the justice process is always challenging. When I spoke earlier about the Colombo plan, it was argued that after the Second World War, 1945, the government of Britain and European governments, were the economies were devastated. That is true. Undoubtedly, that was true. But 1950, the Colombo plan was ruled out to organize an economic framework to mobilize resources where Britain would contribute what they could within a framework. Once you have that framework, Andy, and you have that policy, the resources you can garner together from various sources to begin to address the issues, it rolls forward. The Colombo plan is, was a 50-year plan. It was intended to be a 10-year plan. But it went on into the 1990s, 40 years later, the Colombo plan. If you Google the Colombo plan today, you will still see its contemporary form. But what it really was, was a framework, it was a strategy, and it was a political commitment. And it said, we will find the resources one way or another. Andy, if you analyze this, you will find that much of the money that the Americans gave Britain for their Marshall Plan, Britain diverted a section of that money to the East Indies to help the Colombo Plan. Mm -hmm. Because where there is a will, there's a way. And yes, every moment is always difficult. But with the commitment, with the strategy, the framework, be believe me, history shows you will garner the resources to address those matters that you wish to address. Now, we're getting close to the end. But thank you very much, Hillary. I mean, this has been very, very good, I think, for the for the audience. Uh, but there is a question by Kevin Adonis Brown, 
via Facebook. And he says, does the invitation, your call, right, to bring people back to the table, uh, presume an, an equality or parity that is simply symbolic? Because when you really look at it, uh, you know, our regions are, uh, our countries in the region are sub economically subordinate to the empires that existed before us. And, uh, you know, so it sort of weakens us in some ways in terms of our ability to negotiate with these these big giants. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, I mean, you, you, I mean you, you cannot ignore an argument such as that because it's a history of the extractor of wealth from a community that has been left, as Eric Williams said, such dry and abandoned, the orange principle. Uh, certainly, there is economic inequality. There's no doubt there's economic inequality uh, between those who have been ravished by these colonial crimes and those who have benefited from these colonial crimes. But there is always a feel of moral equality. I mean, there is always a feel of, of a sense of rightness, of humanity on that level, because there are these terrains on which we are all equal. Yes, their states have more economic resources than our states. But there is something called the United Nations in which we are told that all the nations are members of this organization on the basis of equality. And there's also the issue of a discourse. In academia, we are involved in research and discourse. In a discourse such as reparatory justice, there is a fundamental equality because no one is going to say that the intellectuals of the black community are in anywhere inferior to those of Western Europe or the North American white elite. There is an intellectual equality. So there are many levels of equality, but there is this level of economic inequality, which we are seeking to address. So do not be stranglehold into the notion of the hierarchy of authority. That, that indeed is a part of it, but the bigger picture is, I think, arguably more significant, where the intellectual community, the political community, the United Nations, and all of the other pedagogies of justice, there is that, there is that equality. And we must use that equality to make the claim that it is the perfect equality we are looking for. We want to see these countries that have been ravished and impoverished, and these communities, we want to see them have a better shake at a good future. We want this 21st century to be unlike the previous centuries. And if I may end with this statement, Andy, it took us all of the 19th century to legally eradicate slavery. The Haitians started in 1804, the English, the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese, and eventually we got emancipation in Brazil and Cuba, 1880s. It took 60 years to complete that emancipation cycle from the first act of emancipation by the Haitians to the last act of emancipation by the Brazilians, all the other countries in between. A hundred years to stop chattel slavery. The world moved forward. Then we had the 20th century. It took us all of the 20th century to fight for human rights, civil rights, democracy, the right to vote. It took us a hundred years to achieve that in the 20th century. So we are now at the final phase of this journey, the reparatory justice moment, where to bring closure to all of that, this is where we're at, justice for all. And if it take us all of the 21st century, we are not going to give up. We have to achieve these objectives. We're not going to give up. And we cannot brush it under the carpet because there's no carpet in the world that is large enough for us to brush this under. So we will go forward justice for everyone, a magnificent 21st century. But as we prepare, we have to repair. And on that note, I have to say thank you very much, uh, Sir Hilary Beckles, uh, for your wonderful explanation. And, uh, and a thank you to the audience for their wonderful questions as well. And I want to thank the organizers for allowing you to have this platform uh, to push for reparatory justice, which is necessary at this particular point in our history. So thank you very much. All the best. It was my honor. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to engage you. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, thank you.